Please continue to enjoy your lunch, but in the interest of time, we're going to get started with the programming today. Uh, the first item on the agenda every year for the uh, Bar Foundation is a treasurer's report. Unfortunately, our treasurer, Andrew Grossman, had a mean, nasty judge make him be in court someplace today, so he can't be here. Um, but he was good enough to record a short video with an annual report on finances, and I believe that's ready to show all of you now. Good afternoon. I'm Andrew Grossman, and I regret that I couldn't be with you here in person today, especially since the camera adds 10 pounds. As secretary, I don't have much to report, although I do take great notes. As treasurer, I can happily report that the foundation is in excellent financial health with current total assets of nearly $4 million under management. In the last year, we saw our expenses increase rather significantly. And for once, that's a good thing. After the pandemic caused us to pause live events, we were very fortunate to have an enormously successful event featuring John Meacham, which was nearly single-handedly arranged by our fearless leader, Judge Fry. And we saw our charitable giving increase as well in ways you'll be hearing about shortly, which are really making a difference in our community. We have bold plans for next year, which will definitely require bold fundraising. So watch out for that. And finally, I'd just like to say that I'm especially sorry to be missing today's event because two of my most important and meaningful mentors and two of the finest family law attorneys you could ever want to know are receiving their 50-year recognition today. My partner, Tony Auten, who's been with our firm longer than I have, continues to teach me how to practice at the highest level. And of course, my father, Jeff Grossman, who's quite simply just about the best there is. And with that, I'll turn things back over to Judge Fry. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, I want to thank Andrew for his work this year, and uh, we look forward to his uh, continuous service in the following two years. He's uh, president-elect, and then he'll be president. Um, this year, we're honoring three classes of lawyers, as you know, 2020, 2021, and 2022, for those who graduated 50 years earlier in 70, 71, and 72. We have two past presidents of this foundation to uh, make remarks today on behalf of their classes, namely Tom Hill and Nancy Rogers. Tom will be speaking on behalf of the 1970 class, and Nancy will speak on behalf of the 1972 class. So at this point, Tom, would you like to come up and make your remarks? Thank you, Judge Fry. Um, I want to thank the Bar Foundation for the opportunity to speak briefly on behalf of the lawyers who were admitted in 1970, more than 52 years ago. That's a blink of an eye. It's really a treat for me. All the way through high school and college and law school, I was never asked to speak on behalf of any class. Only valedictorians got to do that. And uh, there were always a lot of people with better grades than I had. So my strategy, uh, as simple as it is, and, and in retrospect, was to outlast them. And I did, 52 years later. <laughs> Having been giving, given this opportunity, I'm going to remiss a bit, and I'm going to congratulate us all a bit. Um, as for the reminiscing part, we all know that there have been enormous changes in the practice of law in the last 52 years, and I thought it might be interesting to think back to a couple of the rules that governed us uh, back then that seem, by today's standards, rather an, uh, antiquated. First, you all remember this. In 1970, lawyers were not allowed to advertise. We could be sanctioned for placing an ad in a newspaper or a commercial on radio or television. The most we could do was put a bland little square framed ad in the yellow pages announcing that we were lawyers. To that all changed 
when the U.S. Supreme Court rendered its decision in 1977. And today, lawyers spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year advertising their practices. Second, in 1970, bar associations published minimum fee schedules. Remember them? They were weird. Lawyers were supposed to charge, not charge, less than a specific amount of dollars for a legal service. You couldn't charge less than. No, this is not a maximum fee. It was a minimum fee. And in retrospect, I think that the idea was that established lawyers did not want us then young whippersnappers undercutting them. But those were changed, and those, those minimum uh, bar fee recommendations have long since bit the dust. But the Ohio's rules of civil procedure are still with us. And I mention that for a reason. Ask any new lawyer today what rules preceded the Ohio rules of civil procedure. And their response is likely to be, I have no idea. The civil rules have been around forever. And yes, they have. And so have we. The Ohio civil rules were adopted 52 years ago on July 1, 1970, just a few weeks before we took the bar exam. The same year we were admitted to the bar. Good things seem to last. Now, just a few comments about the work we, we have done as lawyers over the last half century. Woody Allen once said that 90% of success is just showing up. Not true. We know that because we have spent, the, we know that because we have spent the last five decades doing everything within our power to help our clients negotiate the complexities of the law, to properly advise our clients, to faithfully and artfully advocate for them, and to do whatever it takes to, to live up to that oath we all took in 1970 in November after we suffered the uh, risk of phone calls to the bar, to the Supreme Court to see if we passed. We all know that just showing up doesn't cut it in the practice of law. And what, to me, is wonderful and remarkable about all of this is that all of us in the class of 1970 have been engaging in this riveting and relentlessly demanding profession for more than 50 years. For those of you who have retired, you have earned it. For those still practicing, you can take heart in this. When attorney John Morton Finney retired from practicing law on June 25, 1996, it was his 107th birthday. He is believed to have been the oldest practicing attorney in the history of the United States. So for those of you who are still working, keep on plugging. There's plenty of time left. I will now let Nancy take it away and say a few words on, the, on behalf of the class of 1972. Tom, I think I warned you not to walk off with the script. <laughs> so this does, Tom, remind me of. I'm so sorry. Oh, thank you, of a, of a high school graduation speech. Uh, and I think it's traditional classmates of 72 to begin a high school graduation speech with the statement, we made it, right? And then everybody jumps up, the whole class jumps up to celebrate themselves. So I've noticed that it might be a little harder for us to jump up uh, these days, uh, but I do know that we have much more to celebrate. As I looked up the bios of those of you in the class of 1972, it is a distinguished group. Certainly you have been recognized as such, uh, but more important, you should know that over the years you gave your experienced and thoughtful advice to people who were facing some of the greatest challenges in their lives. And you gave your best, and it made a difference. 
And in addition, as I looked over the group, I saw people who were giving of their time to speak out civically, giving of their time to be in public service when they could have earned more in, in private practice, people who gave their time to their faith communities, to the arts communities, who truly made a difference. This is also a time for us to reflect on what we share. Um, the pre-1972 years, if you might recall, the Vietnam War affected nearly all of us during our college and, and law school years, and it was a time of social movements. It was a time of demonstrations. It was a time of student strikes. It was a time of strident, three-word insulting slogans. We, we were used to it then, and I'm guessing that it doesn't surprise us much now. But I do have a report to you, class of 1972, and this is an update on those years. Jack Weinberg, who was a social movement leader during our years, told us not to trust anyone over 30. The update is this, Jack Weinberg, is 82, and he is asking people to trust him in his environmental consulting advice. <laughs> so, we are all, all of us, thankful to the Columbus Bar and the Columbus Bar Foundation. They bring us together in ways that have, over the decades, allowed us together to, to support equal access to justice, to support innovations in the administration of justice. I see several here who helped to introduce mediation to the courts, a very lasting and important change. We stood up for the rule of law, and that is something we still need today, particularly to stand up for. And we welcomed diversity in the profession. And I want to say today that I take some pleasure in saying I believe I will be the very last class speaker who with accuracy can say to you fellow members of the class of 1972, hi guys. <laughs> so even if we give up our full-time work before we're 107, Tom, I think that we, the class of, of 72, can remain active through the bar as volunteers in and contributors to its worthy disputes. And it's my pleasure now to leave the book here, Tom, and to turn things back over to Judge Fry and Sue Porter to recognize your amazing accomplishments. Judge Fry. Tom and Nancy were both uh, spellbinding, and uh, we appreciate the time you put into preparing your remarks to uh, help us today. Um, at this point, uh, Sue and I will uh, hand out to the members of the 50-year classes um, an honorary pin, and you'll have a, a, an opportunity, which you're not required to do, to have a photograph taken with me. If you don't want that, we'll try and get Sue in the picture. <laughs> Sue, do you want to take over and no, call the names? I, I will try. <laughs> okay, great. Welcome, everyone. And uh, we're just honored to be doing this here today. Uh, as I call your name, we're going to please ask you to join Judge Fry in the front of the podium so that we can both give you your pin and recognize you and get that appropriate photograph. It's a good time, you know, while well, you're still on the bench. It's great. All right. We all ready? Hilliard Abrams. Hilliard, I'm sorry. You see, I'm, I didn't do well on the first one. I apologize. All right. I'm going to put it good. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Very Right. George Arnold. Thank you. 
Aha. Tony Otten. <laughs> Mike Becker. James Bonus. Craig Denmead. Okay. All right. We'll make sure that he goes ahead and gets his pin. Jeffrey Grossman. Class spokesperson, Tom Hill. David Hornbeck. Okay. Great. We will make sure he gets his pin as well. Uh, Richard Igo. James Malley. John Nemeth.
Bob Palmer. <laughs> Jim Reedy. <laughs> Ronald Brolin. James Schottenstein. Congratulations. <laughs> David Seidel. Roger Steinhardt. Okay. Yep, we'll go ahead and make sure he uh, gets his pin. Kim Swanson. I know offense, Your Honor, but in my 50 years of practice, I never spent a day in a courtroom. So I think I should have my picture taken with Miss Porter. All right. <laughs> All right. Well. I'm to make it clear. My partner and best friend for these 50 years has been Dave Scheider, and he dressed me. <laughs> Thomas Vivian. Robert Walter. Joel West.
Great. And because I know we had a lot of last minute changes, I just want to ask, have we missed anybody? That's what I was wondering. Come on up. Hmm? Rick, yes, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks so much. Anyone else? Okay, great. Can you please join me in recognizing all of these amazing honorees? Let me offer a few closing remarks as I close out my year as uh, president of our foundation. It's been a great honor to have this job, as uh, many of you know, who have done it previous to me. And uh, we represent, I think, the best efforts of the Bar Association when we come together in a charitable organization like the foundation and try and help the community. We're losing today, and she's unfortunately unable to be here, Kathleen Trafford, who's been for four years an officer of the foundation for us. Prior to that, as you know, she was president of the Bar Association. She's been very active in a number of community organizations. And despite the fact that she says she's retired, she still is active in a lot of things. But Kathleen's work with the board and her last four years as an officer of the foundation have been hugely helpful. Uh, Sue Porter's off to a great start. She's going to be a strong and creative uh, force driving the foundation forward in the future uh, this next year as president as we come out of hopefully our last experience with COVID, uh, although we aren't out of it yet, of course. Before I leave, I wanted to make three requests. The first thing I wanted to alert everybody to is that we do need your help to try to recruit new CBF fellows. The Bar Foundation is made up of a number of fine lawyers. Um, we have just introduced a couple dozen of them here today in person. Um, but the future of any organization is to continue to recruit new and active members and to carry things into the future. Uh, several years ago, our board, even before COVID actually, change the criteria for membership to make it a bit easier for newer lawyers and lawyers that are in um, public defender or legal aid or government offices and might not have quite the financial resources that some of the others of us have been lucky enough to have to make it easier for those people to join the Bar Foundation. And I hope each of you will take some time today, and I believe there are application forms around, to take a blank and to give it to some newer lawyer that um, might be a member of the foundation. Um, I use newer because we're not supposed to use younger because that's ageist or something like that. Um, but seriously, suggest to people that you know in the profession that can help us that they join and that, that it's not merely a financial matter, it's a matter of getting some younger members to the board. We have some already that we've recruited, but we need to keep working to get newer members. Um, the second thing I want to ask you to think about is making a contribution. Uh, foundations run on money. And when you think about your charitable giving for 2022, I hope you'll keep us in mind. We've never been leaned on by the Columbus Bar Foundation to make annual contributions. The buy-in was up front, and after that, it was sort of the honor system. And um, perhaps that was short-sighted, because with inflation and with the ups and downs of the stock market, why sometimes we uh, could use a little more influx of new cash. So please consider a gift this year, um, over and above what all of you have generously given in the past. The other thing I wanted to mention in regard to these first two points, new members and new contributions, is virtually all of us 
became members of the Bar Foundation in the 1990s, 30, 25, 30 years ago. Um, and again, nobody's leaned on us to make contributions, but uh, it is a very good, solid use of your money to help the profession in the community. My third request is to ask each of you to consider the challenges that are facing Central Ohio, and for that matter, the state and the whole country, and how the legal profession working collectively through the Bar Foundation might be able to address things locally. The preamble to the Ohio Code of Professional Responsibility points out that lawyers play a vital role in the preservation of society. And it goes on to say that all lawyers should devote professional time and resources and use civic influence to try to ensure equal access to justice. America's got plenty of challenges right now, not the least, of course, is with immigration. We've got uh, an overwhelming volume and complexity of cases in the national legal system dealing with immigration. Congress seems, at least so far, unable to fix it. Recognizing this, the Barr Foundation this year added new funding to help legal aid expand a program that they had underway at Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is a, uh, an, a community organization that serves primarily Hispanic folks on the west part of the, of the county. Alex Lagouche stepped up. He had funds in a designated fund that was started when he retired, and he donated those funds or directed those funds as part of the funding for Our Lady of Guadalupe so they could add a paralegal just to help with all the enormous amount of paperwork that immigration cases require. Another focus that we took this year was civics education. This has not, as all of us know, been a high priority in American schools for the last 20 or 25 years. And when it is offered, we're told that civics is often taught in a rather dull and passive way rather than with the excitement that I hope most of us felt when we studied American history and government and civics in the 50s and 60s and perhaps later um, when we were in school. The damage that it causes the legal system if civics is not taught and appreciated by the community at large is really substantial. You have citizen misunderstanding and, in fact, outright distrust of the legal system when they don't understand how it works and why it works, how, the manner it does. And frankly, for trial lawyers and trial judges, when we want to have parties get fair jury trials, we, if we can't have confidence that the jurors that we're getting in the courthouse have confidence in the system and understand in some sense why the rule of law is important, why then we're falling down on that really fundamental promise that we made to each other in the state and federal constitutions that we'll let your disputes be decided by a jury. So with that in mind, this spring the foundation, as uh, Andrew mentioned, um, responded in a first step by reaching out to uh, about 200 teachers and high school students. We bought them dinner at the convention center. John Meacham was brought in as a speaker. In addition, we had uh, really wonderful remarks from Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor and from Chief, Chief Judge Marbley at the District Court. Um, it was spellbinding and it was, in our understanding, from talking afterwards to the teachers and students and I got some letters at the courthouse from folks that had attended. Um, they were very inspired. And so our board anticipates trying to repeat something like that for 2023. But there may be other ways to do it than um, inviting students and teachers to those kinds of functions. So when each of you think about the Bar Foundation, think about ideas that you may have and how to fund them to bring out better ways of reaching the public and improving the civics um, education and the civics confidence um, in the community here in Central Ohio. Um, we can't do anything about what happens in the Beltway and what's on the national cable news, but we do have, I think, a real obligation to try to do as much as we can locally to keep up confidence in the rule of law and respect for the rule of law. Collectively, folks, we can leave a legacy through the foundation that none of us can leave individually. So I thank you all once again for joining us today. 
and I'm told that at this point I should direct your attention to the screen so that you can take a look at some more information about some of the organizations and causes that the foundation supported in the last year. I think we're ready for that. Since 1950, the Columbus Bar Foundation has worked to increase access to justice, improve the administration of justice, and promote excellence in legal education. Thanks to generous support from donors, donors just like you, the foundation has distributed over $4 million in grants to deserving organizations. Those organizations have in turn provided critical services to those who have nowhere else to turn. The impact that the Bar Foundation has on our organization is significant. First of all, the length of the relationship really helps build some stability. When we look at our budget each year and are thinking about what we are able to project, having that strong commitment and the length of that relationship is really helpful in terms of making sure that, that we are stable and, and know uh, what to expect as we are planning. In addition, we do really appreciate the fact that it is often general funding and that general funding allows allows us to, to pivot in and to provide that in whatever area of trend or need that we see within the organization. So the Self-Help Resource Center opened in 2016 and we help people with their civil municipal court issues. So that includes eviction, small claims lawsuits, record sealing, and just about anything else that walks in our door. The Bar Foundation has been one of our most important partners since day one. Our office actually was created through the new lawyers group of the CBA. So just even getting the idea off the ground into the judges, onto the judges table was essential. From there, the Bar Foundation helped to build our first office. They provided office supplies for us. They bought all of our computers, the computers we still use to this day, as well as gave us all those upstart money that we needed to move forward. Community Mediation Services partnership with the Bar Foundation goes back to its, our inception 32 years ago. And we work in partnership with legal aid as well to help tenants who are involved in eviction related cases. Specifically, legal aid helps those tenants that have a legal defense that can be raised. CMS is there to help those tenants that don't have a legal defense. The Bar Foundation support helps us keep the most vulnerable people in our community stabilized in their housing. One of our newest grant recipients is the Catholic Social Services Our Lady of Guadalupe Center in West Columbus, where Columbus Bar Foundation dollars are being used to fund a very important paralegal position. The Columbus Bar Foundation feels it's important to fund programs such as the Guadalupe Center because we need to provide access to our community to legal services. And through the Guadalupe Center, we have wonderful uh, opportunities for people to have help with immigration matters. And we found that was a real need within the community. It fit within our mission and vision, and we were very excited to be able to fund it. Thanks to the Columbus Bar Foundation, we now have an on-site paralegal. So when our clients come in for food and other services, we're able to give that full wraparound service. The paralegal uh, position allows us to do a thorough pre-screen and ensure that our attorney is able to assist them in the particular case that they're looking at. My role working with Legal Aid is the managing attorney for the immigration program. And then at the Guadalupe Center, I am the immigration attorney on duty three days a week. And um, because of the Columbus Bar Foundation, we were able to um, hire a paralegal who's also Spanish speaking, and she's able to help us assist all of the uh, clients at the Guadalupe Center. The Columbus Bar Foundation has provided me with this opportunity to do something that I really love because I was at, at Legal Aid, I was in a place where I couldn't move up any further, and so that's when I decided to go to school to, you know, be a paralegal so I can move up a little bit. And then to find out that there's an opening for an immigration, um, you know, position, I was just so thrilled. I just want to thank the Columbus Bar um, Foundation for this opportunity um, that opened up for me. Um, without them, we would not be able to do this and I'm hoping that it continues on. Leadership of the Columbus Bar Foundation recognizes the importance of inspiring young members of our community to learn about civics and history. 
particularly during these divisive times when too many discussions become polarized. This year, the Foundation sponsored the first in what promises to be a long tradition of civics education events designed for high school students. I first heard about the event, um, my, my English teacher brought it up with me um, during class and she thought it was something I'd really interested in because even during class we'd have a lot of discussions and a lot of like kind of opinionated topics where we'd move to from side to side in the classroom. I did not know who John Meacham was, but as soon as I saw it, um, I wanted to jump on the opportunity. I'm not an I'm, I'm not a social studies teacher, but Charles had um, from the beginning his first time he'd said, "Oh yes, I would like to be a senator someday." And I thought, "Oh my gosh, this is perfect for him." I think that the event was very impactful because it's a very unique experience for high school students to be able to meet judges, famous author, lawyers um, in Columbus and. And I think that just, I became a lot more engaged in our judicial system um, just by meeting all the judges. Um, I think the foundation should definitely have similar events in the future. It's important to keep discussing these topics. Um, it shouldn't just be a one-time thing where you discuss it with a group of people. It needs to be a thing that occurs regularly discussing different topics or um, going more into depth with different speakers. My hopes and dreams for the Columbus Bar Foundation over the next five years really include making sure that all of the lawyers in our community know about the good things that it does and can do. And to look at how we increase support, make sure that the next generation of lawyers are involved in the foundation and help us educate ourselves, our students, and the rest of the community and provide access. And I think there's a number of ways we can go about doing that, including getting the word out and also talking about what are the new programs we should be supporting. The Columbus Bar Foundation has faithfully served the community for more than 70 years. As we look to the future, we know there's much more to be done. The needs of our society are greater than ever, and your contributions work. The challenges we face may seem insurmountable, but the Columbus Bar Foundation is committed to our city, our mission, and our partners. It's now time to install the newly elected board members and trustees. Uh, Judge Jiza Page from our court is here, Judge Page, and she'll administer the oath. Um, I think I should mention that, uh, as you know, Andrew couldn't be here to uh, take the oath as his next office. And we also are missing Judge Riedler from the Sixth Circuit who had to sit on a panel today in Cincinnati, unfortunately, and he sends his regrets, but Chad's a new uh, returning, actually, trustee on the Bar Foundation. When he was in private practice, he was on our board, and uh, uh, we're terribly grateful to have Chad come back now that he's a Sixth Circuit judge. With that, I'll turn it over to Judge Page. Will those of you who uh, are supposed to be sworn in come up? Do you have a list? Or? Sue has a list. All right. Um, Jeff Conkler, Brandy Rangen, Aaron Herbst, Michael Jordan, and Lisa Pierce Rice. And I'll get out of the way so you guys can do the work. Thank you, Judge Fry. If you could all please raise your right hand. With the newly elected officers and trustees of the Columbus Bar Foundation Board of Trustees, Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, and please state your name. I, Jeff Conkler. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support. That I will support. The Constitution and bylaws. The Constitution and bylaws. Of the Columbus Bar Foundation. Of the Columbus Bar Foundation. 
And I will faithfully, honestly, and impartially. And I will faithfully, honestly, and impartially. Discharge the duties of and please state your office. Discharge the duties of trustee. To the best of my ability and understanding. To the best of my ability and understanding. Congratulations, you have been duly sworn in. Thank you. Thank you. I now have the privilege of administering the oath to President Sue Porter. Sue, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, and please state your name. I, Sue Porter. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution. That I will support the Constitution. And bylaws of the Columbus Bar Foundation. And bylaws of the Columbus Bar Foundation. And will faithfully, honestly, and impartially. And will faithfully, honestly, and impartially. Discharge the duties of President. Discharge the duties of president. To the best of my ability and understanding. To the best of my ability and understanding. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Uh, congratulations. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm hoping to get to know all of you soon. And I thought I would start by saying thank you for attending an in-person event. We had to wait <laughs> years to come together again, and I think it's important that we start, that we honor everyone that is here, and really do the work of the community that we've created here in Columbus. Um, for those of you who don't know me, and I want to talk just a little bit about my journey, because I'm hoping to get to know so much about yours in the, in the next year. Um, I first came to Columbus in 1985, which seems like yesterday, but it's uh, a few years ago now. Um, I was an unusual person to recruit to Columbus. I was a Michigan native. I went to that school up north, and I was going to law school at Boston University. Okay, why pick Columbus instead of going to some of the East Coast offers I had? Well, I think there was one major reason that I know I made that decision. And again, we have to remember, I was coming to Columbus for one year. I was going to do that and then decide where I was going to be. But I went to an interview for Schottenstein, Zox, and Dunn, and they had sent somebody who was an unusual recruiter. Her name was Beth Mayo. Some of you may remember her. She was a wonderful, wonderful person here. That was the first time I had ever met a woman partner at a law firm. I didn't really, I had heard they existed, but I didn't know. That was the only person that I saw in any of the recruiting that year that was a woman that a law firm had sent out. Now, Beth was incredibly persuasive, and she said, come to Columbus. I, said, I don't know. OK, I will come. Um, that started what was my 30-year career at Schottenstein, Zox, and Dunn. Uh, I was able to work with many, many wonderful people. But I will remember something in the first year of practice that I think was so important. And that was getting called into Mel Schottenstein's office. And again, there might be a few of you who remember Mal. What a, what a force of nature, right? He called me and he said, this community needs something. We've got to think about our airport. What community can grow without having an important airport and something? But the community had not put enough attention, in his mind, in what we were going to do with the airport. So he said, I want you to see how we do this and how we get community support. And it is so important, if you're going to have a practice in this community, that you get involved. OK, so I sat through this. And, and isn't it interesting that we're still expanding the airport to bring in companies like Intel and all of those other companies we're bringing in? But Mel was visionary in that way and had a huge impact on my life. And of course, the other person was Ben Zox. Ben Zox calls you in when you're a new lawyer in there. And he says, the Bar Association is an incredibly important place to be. I'm sure many of you had conversations with Ben over the years about how we had to give back. The Bar Association was important. And in particular, the foundation, you know, he was very, very invested in this. And so being here today means a lot to me because of Ben's legacy and how I can walk in some of his really big footsteps as part of this. You know, I didn't think I would, would still be involved in the law. In 2015, uh, I was decided to retire from then the Ice Miller firm. 
said, okay, that's a great thing. 30 years is a good time. I'm going to do that. But one of my partners came in and said, well, will you go ahead and sit on the foundation board? You know, you've been on boards, you did this. I was like, oh, sure, I'll have a lot of time. Seems like a good thing. Uh, a few months later, uh, I recognized my passion for the arts was going to give me another career. And I became, I moved from a board member of Ballet Met to the executive director. So my co-leader, Edward Liang, our artistic director, and I run um, a very active and wonderful arts organization. It is the most complicated small business that I have ever been involved in with a big school, a big education committee, and a lot of performances, which of course were impacted during the pandemic. But what I did learn in working with an organization in which we have an $8 million budget, we have to raise half of that every year to survive, is that we all have to give back in different ways and we have to protect the things in our community that are important and we have to figure out how to do more. Um, I'm hoping that both of these careers are gonna help the foundation as we hope to transition from an organization that has done amazing things, right? When I went back and looked, this foundation has existed since 1950. That's amazing. We currently have $4 million in resources that we've used in amazing, in amazing ways. However, if we could triple the size of this foundation, think of what we could do. The things on that video would be a small part of what we're doing, and they all need more resources, and we have to figure out ways within our legal community, hopefully, to bring those resources in. We have a wonderful board of talented people, and I think we've all enjoyed the um, opportunity to bring programs such as the community mediation services, the self-help resource center at the municipal court, legal aids immigration uh, program, again, really important things. And I couldn't tell you how excited we were when Judge Fry brought this new idea and said, it is the kids in our community that are our hope. What are we doing to make sure that they know about the law, listening to John Meacham, Judge Marbley, Judge O'Connor, it was an amazing experience. I sat at a group, at a table with a group of students and their teachers. The teachers whispered to me partway through the night, this is the best night of my professional life. And I'm looking at her, I'm like, okay, you're a teacher, you have these great students, but that was the best night that she was identifying with. And the students were all involved in that as well. We have to provide those types of ex uh, experiences and who better than us to do that and to make sure that that education goes on. These kids, they need to know that it's important to vote, that they need to know how the legal system works. They need to know how it works so they can figure out if it's working for them or if they want to change it. Those are all important things and we've got to educate and be part of that. And I really hope this, that we as a board and as a community can do more of that as we go in the future. So with that, I have a question for all of you in the room. How many of you are currently fellows of the foundation? I want you to raise your hand. Okay, that's, that's really good and that's important. Thank you all for that kind of support. I have another question. How many of you don't know if you're a fellow or not? <laughs> right, okay, I know that those hands didn't go up quite as far, but there's a few people, because I went back and looked when I was getting involved. All right, that really shouldn't be. We should know it is important. We've got to figure out a better communication strategy to make sure that people know, so that we can all have the experience, and I know many of you have already done this with young people within, um, your practices and, and your lives and bringing them in. But we have to communicate. We do amazing things. People should know about that. We've got to contribute more to it and expand these programs. So with that, I hope you will all help me uh, as we go through the year. I would like to thank Judge Fry. He has been incredibly inspiring. The new program that he has set up, I think, will leave a wonderful legacy to our students. Thank all of the people who've agreed to either continue or be on the foundation board. We have lots of things to do as we weather the post-pandemic. And I'd like to thank Jill and her whole team. They do a lot. They do not have all the resources um, that we would want at the time. And we have to thank them for what they're doing each and every day.
And most of all, I want to thank all of you, especially the honorees. You have shared your resources, shared your talent, shared your wisdom. I hope you will continue doing that and get more involved in what we're trying to do within the uh, foundation. Thank you very much. I appreciate all you do. Have a wonderful day.